as a as a Tamil, and I should ideally be speaking in Tamil. Uh, somebody who grew up in North India, uh, I'm not in a position to do so. So I shall speak in English, and uh, hopefully, what what I say, the gist of it, uh, can be made available through translation uh, afterwards. This is a it's a great honor and privilege to be part of this event <coughs> for a number of reasons. Firstly, Akshay Mukul is a dear friend and a colleague, somebody uh, who I first worked with when we were together at the Times of India more than 15 or 16 years ago. I was familiar with his work before then because he used to work for the Hindustan Times. And what marked out his uh, journalism then was a great sense of passion and commitment to questions of social justice, but also a willingness and a desire and an interest to engage with questions of culture, questions of ideology, big questions of history. And the book that he has uh, produced, which came out last year, and I was fortunate to be part of the launch of the English edition as well, uh, is really um, a remarkable piece of journalism, but of political literature in India, I think, and history writing. <coughs> because it... deploys the resources of, of a journalist, the doggedness with which you pursue a story, trying to ferret out every last bit of information. He reminded me today about our meeting in Chennai, maybe two and a half years ago when I was at the Hindu and he wanted to consult, uh, look at the possibility of some of the Puddar correspondence, some things being in the Hindu archives. And uh, only a dedicated journalist, a journalist who understands the importance of <coughs> the craft. And unfortunately today, the number of journalists who understand and appreciate and are allowed to engage with uh, the craft of journalism is coming down in our country. But only a journalist who understood the importance of that would have gone about his research uh, in such a dedicated fashion. Not being satisfied with simply mining the treasure trove that were the Poddar <coughs> papers, but trying to pull together all other references, all other corroborated materials in order to weave a narrative <coughs> of the place that an institution like the Gita Press occupies in the cultural and political history of India and of modern, of modern India. Now, the Gita Press is one of those institutions whose power and influence over generations of Indians has been enormous. But which have exerted their influence and power largely in an un unobserved fashion below the radar. The question of, and it's interesting that the other speakers have also commented on the three books <coughs> that are being released today, the link between Akshay Mukul's Gita Press, Premdhan Bazaar's critique of the Bhagavad Gita and Periyar's, Periyar's own writings. <coughs> and it seems to me that <coughs> Puddar and or rather Mukul and Bazaz are trying to analyze and critique or to grapple with the big questions of how 
at various points of history, bazaars going back to ancient Indian history or mythology and Mukul in the 20th century. How influential players in society have tried to define and lay down what they believe is the standard of an ideal person. An ideal Hindu in the case of Podar and Gita Press. An ideal warrior in the case of Krishna's discourse in the Bhagavad Gita. Today, the discussion on of what constitutes an ideal Hindu, an ideal warrior gets conflated in the debate over what an ideal Indian should be. It's not coincidental that today we are in the midst of this entire uh, forced, forced discussion on what it means to be Indian, how earlier uh, definitions of the idea of India are somehow inadequate, somehow uh, not substantial, some are not authentic and that there is need for a, a new kind of nationalist Indian to emerge. So these are very much the substance of the, the stuff of the critique that bazaars mounts well in a, in a very different sort of sense. I'm familiar with his broad writing and I've been going through his critique of the Gita which has been out of print for many years and it's a great service that you have done to bring this kind of book and the scholarship of Pandit Premnath Bazaar back into circulation. In a way, this is what Bazaar is doing and what Mukul has done with uh, the book on Gita Press is to subject this emergence of the ideal to uh, a full-blown cultural, historical, political critique. <laughs> and of course, Periyar is there in the margins here, reminding us that any definition of the ideal uh, is incomplete without the question of justice, without the question of dignity being placed at the center stage. And it struck me that these big debates, these big questions of what is an, what what kind of nation do we do we want? What kind of a country is India? If you divorce that question and the definition of the ideal from the kind of priorities that somebody like Periyar had, if you remove questions of dignity and justice from your conception of what is the ideal citizen, what is the ideal Indian? even if you like what is the ideal Hindu, you will end up with something that is very, very retrogressive, very, very damaging. And that is precisely what we are seeing today in some of the debates that are unfolding around us. In my view, it's not a coincidence that the people who today are posing the big questions of and being the most insistent about nation, nationalism are the ones who also declare that there can be no debate or discussion around these big questions. So we see for, for the first time in many years, perhaps since the emergency, this idea that if you ask questions about government policy, it may be surgical strike, so-called surgical strike on Pakistan or demonetization or any other action that is taken by the government in the name of the country, in the name of the nation, then you get branded as not just a critic of the government or the critic of the party that is in power, but as an anti national So how certain kinds of ideas get privileged and get to occupy that position of being closely identified with nation, how certain people arrogate to themselves the right to define what is India, what is nation. And the irony is that the very people who kept aloof, who kept their distance from the freedom struggle. Today we hear a lot about Deen Dayal Upadhyay, Savarkar, 
Hegdevar, Golwalkar, these are all people who were adults or had passed away or were in the prime of their life when the freedom struggle was at its height, connected to the RSS or Hindu Mahasabha in one way or the other. But other than Savarkar, who had an early association with the national movement and then begged for forgiveness from the British in order to get released from Andaman Jail. This entire strand, the very people today who arrogate to themselves the right to define what is India, what is a nation, what is the ideal Indian, these are the very people who kept their distance from the freedom struggle. And were preoccupied instead, and if you go through uh, Gita Press as, as, a, as a book and see the kind of debates and questions that preoccupied uh, the Hindu right, uh, you can understand why confronting the British, standing up for the rights of the oppressed in India, standing up for the dignity and social justice of uh, the broad masses were the last things that were uh, important for uh, the Hindu right, broadly speaking, of which the Gita Press is one kind of an exemplar. At the same time, if you read Akshay, Akshay's book, you, you also understand that it is not always possible to neat, draw neat equivalences between a cultural, a social, cultural, political phenomenon like what Gita Press was and the uh, full-blown ideology and culture of, of Hindutva or the kind of politics of the RSS and BJP today. There are multiple overlaying factors, issues, but each in their own way has to be understood for what they represent. And here it's interesting what emerges from the archives is also the degree to which at various points in time different elements of the Congress party who uh, officially espouse a more modern secular conception of nationhood also are fully involved in this uh, futile debate on the idea of an ideal Hindu and this, and involved in this idea of drawing an equivalence between somebody's identity as a Hindu and their identity as an Indian. To my mind today, no matter how much the Prime Minister or the BJP keeps talking of Ek Bharat, Shresh Bharat, Sabka Saad, Sabka Vikas, the issue of the dignity of different sections of the people and their right as citizens of this country to justice, dignity, livelihood, their right to have state assistance in the event that they are <coughs> subject to generations of discrimination or marginalization. This is the fundamental challenge that confronts us today and which in the name of speaking of one India, in the name of having a flat sense of national identity, what is attempted to be done is to suppress and erase all of these different struggles for justice. So we can see in the case say, of Rohit Venula, instead of confronting the problem of what kind of discrimination Dalits are subjected to in the institutions of higher learning. Instead of, even if you don't want to call it discrimination, instead of confronting the problems that people from diverse backgrounds objectively face in a university of that kind, which culminated or led to a series of events which finally led to his 
suicide or what his comrades call administrative killing. You have the Ministry of Human Resources Development, a party a committee to go into whether Roy Kamala was really a Dalit or not. What relevance does that kind of question have? And you could have the Prime Minister of this country engaging in this meaning, meaningless rhetoric that shoot, the Dalit, shoot me first before you shoot uh, and shoot, shoot a Dalit or whatever. This kind of uh, uh, really completely meaningless which is also a kind of identity politics and a kind of vote bank politics even though they profess to be against identity politics and vote bank politics. So this pro uh, understanding this process of the role that communalism, communal conceptions of identity, communal constructions of what it means to be Indian has uh, understanding the role that this has played historically and in particular in the 20th century. Uh, to my mind, both the books of Bazaars and of Akshay Mukul play a very, very important role. And here I was struck by the fact that Bazaars, in some of the sections that I leaf through, is sharply critical of the uh, ambivalent politics of the Congress Party. He mentions, for example, and you see reflections of this in, some, in, in Akshay Mukul's book, the same kind of a uh, duality. Bazaars mentions how despite what was known about V. D. Savarkar's role historically, his contribution to the emergence of the two nation theory, because he spoke of India as a country truly belonging to only those for whom this was not just a Pitra Bhumi, but a so-called Punya Bhumi. So it is not enough that you were born here, but spiritually and religiously you had to revere this land. And those whose religions originated in other parts of the world could never be true Indians in his world, in his, in his view. And you see this toxic poisonous idea continuing today with the RSS and they don't hide, they don't shy away from this. So Bazaar's points out how despite the fact that Savarkar was implicated in the assassination of Gandhiji, espoused till, his, till the end of his life, uh, vicious communal uh, politics. Uh, the Congress party did not think twice about honoring him with a stamp, giving him a label of great national leader. And if you look at the 20th century, you have many, many examples of how when it suits a party like the Congress, flirting with communal ideas of what it means to be Indian is uh, something that they quite easily do and are quite adept at doing. So I uh, would like to congratulate the publishers for uh, your very good sense of judgment in your selection of books. I understand you bring out 15 to 18 titles a year. But you really choose these titles very, very wisely. Because in a, at a time when you have a huge number of titles available in India, which mystify, which confuse, which obscure the reality of what is happening. At a time when we willingly at a mass level, subscribe to cults of personality and believe claims that our leaders make that we know are not true. At such a time to bring out volumes like, like this, the writings of Periyar, Premnath Bhadaza's critique of the Bhagavad Gita and Akshay Mukul's masterly history of the Gita press. I think you've done a signal service, not just to the reading public in Tamil Nadu, but I dare say to the public sphere as a whole across India, uh, particularly with the retrieval of the Bazaar's manuscript, the Bazaar's book, which as I said was not available and represents one of the important products, important writings 
of a man who sadly has faded from public memory despite his immense contribution as a democratic personality and <coughs> as an intellectual uh, who wrote with great deal of uh, knowledge and sympathy about the problems of Jammu and Kashmir and India as a whole. So thank you very much to the publishers and thank you for inviting me and of course congratulations to you again, Akshay.